I should turn that down. Can you hear me okay, Kai? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Good. Does Mac not have a... No, I get to talk into your microphone. You're talking to this microphone. Okay. Hello. <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna make them for all of them. Might just need to ID them and figure out how I wanna lay it out. That one was just really easy because I... The like tiny little guys. Um, these are common white. Um, they are a pain. They eat everything. They're like... Yeah. I set them straight. How many viewers we got? Michelle's in there, so. One. One. See, I don't actually do these for the, the, I think the video potential is like the real. Yeah. It's like yeah. all of this. So you can, can come this way if you need the Taurus phone. Oh. Yeah. There is no price. There is no like five dollar price. It says the four year olds. It doesn't say. Yeah, we're good. Ready? Welcome back to the Butterfly House and Aquarium Behind the Scenes live series where we take you behind the scenes to show you some of the cool and interesting things that you normally might not see or know about here. How exciting. I'm excited. Hopefully you're excited. I know my friend Colton here is excited. Welcome back, Colton. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah. Remind all the fine people out there, all two of them, what you do here at the Butterfly House. So I am one of our two biologists. I care for all of the butterflies and our ambassador animals. So basically, if it doesn't go in the water, I care for it. So that's what I do. Go. Well, now I like asking fun questions. And I've already asked you a fun question, so I'm going to ask you a brand new fun question. Okay. If you could care for any animal in the world, what animal would you choose? Uh, so I'm always, I've always been a bird guy. Birds are my favorite thing in the world. If I could work with a uh, red-tailed hawk, that would be great. I love working with red-tailed hawks. I think they're super cool. I think they're great uh, show animals. I think they do great for educational purposes. So that would be what I would love to get back to. I would love to work with them again. Uh, get to see them again. That would be awesome. So in your wildest fantasy, I get to go. Red tail hawk. Yeah. You could choose like Harpy's eagle, but you choose red tail hawk. Um, well, there's other cool animals. Like, I would love to work with turkey vultures. They're super cool, obviously. And then um, I'm always a big fan of like crows and ravens. Mm -hmm. I think those guys are wicked smart and super cool. So, but the one that's always really charismatic and really good for educational purposes is the red tail hawk. So, I'll always be partial to it. You make a good point. It's hard to argue. <laughs> well. Tell the people what we're going to be doing today. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about our wonderful insect displays, about pinning butterflies and pinning insects and the process that goes into it, and the displays here we have at the Butterfly House and Aquarium. Sounds wonderful. So my first question is, what is the purpose of, you know, pinning in general and these boxes? So pinning in general is one, to give us wonderful specimens of the species so that you can do in-depth scientific studies, look at how the structure works and actually get a good idea of what makes up the insects, all of its parts. And it's uh, really useful for clear identification of species. Uh, many different types of butterflies are near indistinguishable when they're moving around, flying around. Uh, so once we get, once they have passed on, uh, we can make these nice displays of them and we can see the small, tiny detail differences between the species. Awesome. And there's a, you know, there's a use for 
the butterflies after they die. Yeah, so here at the Butterfly House and Aquarium, uh, all of our species live out their entirety of their life in the conservatory, and then once they've uh, naturally uh, died, we can collect their bodies if possible. Obviously, it's not always possible. Uh, and then we can preserve them and turn them into these displays, one so that the guests can see it, and we can start. We can build up slowly a full collection of every butterfly we've gotten. Awesome, Very <laughs> interesting. So I know on this first wall that we are looking at, I see six boxes. Yes. Why? What is? What's the difference between the boxes? Uh, so several of these boxes are currently set up to be the different areas that our butterflies come from. So these boxes right here on this side, uh, these are butterflies that only come from the area around Asia. Ecologically speaking, for butterflies, Asia includes things like India, uh, Eastern Asia, uh, places like China, Japan, and then also like Indonesia and Australia. Those tend to be one big uh, geographic area for most of the butterflies so it's difficult to break them down farther and then in other boxes we have like our species that come from africa individually uh when you're discussing ecologically this means sub-saharan africa very specifically you wouldn't find these mostly along like egypt or anywhere uh so that's how these are broken down and then the final one we have uh, over here is the biggest group we have is our north america central america south america butterflies uh, what this really means is, since we are a tropical species butterfly place, this really means like very middle of Mexico to like the north of South America. That's where most of these butterflies ranges are. So that's a wide range for one box. Yes. So are any of the specimens we have here particularly rare or uncommon? Um, so some that are incredibly difficult to get, we have right here, we have some of our bird wings. Bird wings come from just the areas around Australia. They're an incredibly rare species of butterfly, uh, and they are home. Uh, they are the species that contains one of the rarest butterflies in the world, uh, the Queen Elizabeth uh, bird wing, um, one of the largest butterflies in the world. And these guys are really rare. One, because they tend, because of where they come from, they tend to have difficulties making it here in full tact. We do receive our chrysalis, but chrysalis, uh, if in transit for too long, have problems. So they tend to have emergence issues and have all those problems. So the fact that we have such a wonderful, nice collection of them here is actually really ha makes me very happy. Awesome. It makes me happy too to come and look at. Um, you know, you mentioned we have this wonderful collection. Do you have any idea how long it's taken to put together? Um, this so. To my knowledge, they started to collect the butterflies more or less from the start. Um, so this has been a collection almost as old as the Butterfly House and Aquarium itself. Obviously, I don't believe there are any individual specimens that have been around since the start of the Butterfly House and Aquarium. They do uh, slowly decay over time in these display boxes that are in this style. On this side of the wall, we have a different style of how display boxes work. This is more of a pressed, they're put with a cotton material. Uh, it's slightly worse for actually seeing the structures of the butterflies, that's why it's a different style. Um, but in this method, it's essentially aerobic, so it doesn't get any air. It, it will spend far less time breaking down slowly because of the air. Uh, like for example, these guys uh, come from the 1970s. So they're older than me, they're in perfect condition, but obviously you can't get a good idea of what they actually look yeah. like. Huh. I did not know they were that <laughs> That's really, really impressive. Um, do we have anything other than butterflies pinned in the end of our box? Yes. So on this wall over here, which our wonderful cameraman will show you, uh, we have a collection of insects. So this entire section was donated by a kind gentleman who, uh, this was the culmination of all of his life's collection, both uh, personal that he uh, bought himself or caught himself and things he was able to buy at like auctions and stuff. Uh, he kindly donated them and we have a wonderful collection of a series of insects, bees, and spiders. So we do have a couple other fun displays. Uh, as you can see with the insects, they're actually pinned in a much more complicated way than the butterflies. We'll go back and I'll show you guys how to pin a butterfly. 
Um, for insects, it's actually a m far more complicated uh, process. It requires dozens, if <laughs> Uh, dozens of pins to actually get them all properly done. Uh, each of the joints needs to be properly manipulated once you've uh, relaxed the butterfly uh, or the insect and are able to start the process of pinning. Uh, it's just fascinating seeing their wings. You know, they're mm -hmm. so delicate, and they're for almost all of these, they're, they're completely intact, which is yes. really impressive. Yes. Um, so all insect wings have a vein structure, which is actually the uh, part of the wing you're attempting to manipulate. Uh, when I show you in the back how that process works, but uh, essentially all insect wings are the same structure. It's this nice overlay of veins and hardened outer skeletal exoskeleton, and then they have like a thin layer of membrane that connects them, covered generally in scales that allows them to fly. So, Interesting. way more complicated than you know, most people probably have any idea about, but still fascinating. Okay, my last question before we head to the back is let's say, let's take one of one of these large boxes we have over here. Let's say you start with all the specimen you would need to make it. Mm -hmm. How long do you think it would take to put together that box? Uh, so putting together the box, uh, like if you have the specimens and none of them are pinned yet, they're all just prepared to be pinned. Uh, it takes uh, days to get them to relax often. The smaller the butterfly, the faster that process. So like with our big owls and morphos, those guys can spend two to three days inside of what's called a relaxing chamber. Uh, it just makes the butterfly's body manipulable again uh, because after they have died, rigor mortis sets in and their body structure tightens up. Um, but for these guys, the whole process of making this, it would take uh, several days to relax and then probably a day or two of just the pinning process. And then once they've been pinned, they need to, again, they need to let that rigor mortis set back in. So it would take another two or three days. So making one of these boxes is at least a seven day process. Oh. Wow. I did not know it took that long. <laughs> Uh, why don't we go back and, and see about pinning, pinning a butterfly? Yeah, I would love to show you guys the process. It's super fascinating. Thank you, sir. You're welcome, Mac. So... Back here is where we actually have our uh, butterfly pinning station. It's not a super complicated uh, actual, like in terms of its equipment. All you need is a few simple things. So we have pins. This is to hold and manipulate the butterfly. And then we have a series of strips of paper. So when you actually like touch butterflies, they lose the scales on their wings. So it loses a lot of that nice coloring and you often rip the membrane. Uh, so what these do is they allow us to, as you can see here with some examples, uh, they keep the butterfly's wing pressed in whichever position I have manipulated them to. So you need some material to pin onto. We have channels for their bodies to go in, pins and strips. And then the other more important process, this is actually the like key thing, is the relaxing chamber that I was discussing. So it's a pretty simple thing. It's filled with peat moss and then that peat moss is soaked with gin or water. Uh, the water is to rehydrate the body, to get rid of that rigor mortis process and allow you to move and manipulate the insect again. The gin is in there to destroy things like moss or disease, mold, <coughs> mold uh, because they are dead insects, they are dead material, so it's very common that they have problems with that. Um, so, we will put in insects, uh, we'll put in butterflies that we think are doing really well. And we have this, uh, this is just a piece of Kydex. It's a water, res uh, water shedding material, uh, just to act as a nice platform. You don't need anything that fancy. Um, and it allows us to take the insect and have its wings mobile again. So I can manipulate it like that. Whereas comparatively, these are butterflies that have not been relaxed. If I try and take their wings and I do that same process, it has that crunching sound you can hear. It's because the body is physically not, the, the body is physically resisting me when I do that. Um, 
So the pinning process is fairly simple for butterflies. Uh, we take it and we rather violently first take a pin and we jam it through the center of the body. So this is the main one we're going to be using. This keeps the butterfly where we want it. And we can set it down and put it down onto our pinning board. And then very simply, I was talking about that vein structure. So right along the top of the butterfly's wing here, you can see it has this nice harder outer vein. If we take the pin and we very lightly move it like this, we can manipulate along that outer wing, that outer ridge, and we're able to position the wing the way we want it. Um, if you're being really careful, you can in fact do this without ever puncturing the wing. Um, some of the insects we're doing have a very uh, rigid structure. The wing is already slightly damaged, so putting in that much effort is not always worth it. It takes a lot of time and effort to do that. And then, as you can see, I've put simple process. We put one above the top wing and then below it, and then we put it here. Uh, so that just keeps the wings in this nice structure that we can see that this guy has made. And then when positioning the butterflies, there's two different styles we do. We do one for the butterflies we sell, which is an aesthetic way. So we'll pin them in a way that makes the butterfly look pretty. Uh, and then for our own display boxes, we do a much more scientific way. Um, scientific, the method is essentially to take the top wings and move them at the very least up to the 90 degree angle that you can see here from the bottom. So this guy, he's got this 90 degree process coming out. Just, And then the other part is the we want the bottom wing almost entirely visible. So a lot of people don't like how that looks in like a box they want to put on their wall so we try and pin the butterflies in a separate manner um, but that's the whole process with pinning the butterflies do you have any questions about sure. it Matt? what is the most difficult part for you um the most difficult part for me is often as you can see the butterflies do not have consistent ways in which they have died so sometimes they keep their wings closed despite the fact they've died. Sometimes they open them and sometimes they'll even do, do I have an example, where they've, oh, they've pushed in the opposite direction. So they have like this way, this way, and then that way. And when it's the wings are up, it's, that's always the most difficult one to pin because one, I also, I have to bring the wings down completely. Um, and I can either just pin them so that the rings are down, let them set for two days, and then put them back in the relaxation chamber and then adjust them, which increases the process to like eight, nine days to pin a butterfly. Obviously, a lot of that is just waiting. Yeah. But, um, or I have to very carefully adjust while keeping the wing down. Hmm. So it's that's probably the most difficult part. Interesting. That, is, that sounds frustrating. <laughs> Why don't they all just die the right way? <laughs> Um, where do we get all of the specimen that we use to pin butterflies? Uh, so all of our specimens come from our conservatory, um, unless a butterfly were to die before it was released, which does happen. Sometimes they emerge properly, come out perfectly fine, and then some. on some level there's just a genetic issue and they, they die. Um, but other than that, we collect our butterflies. Essentially, they just fall out of the sky when they're done. Whenever they've run out of energy, they'll fall to the ground. If we find them before our birds or our turtles or our koi or the ants or any other insect, any other uh, animals in the conservatory find them, if we find them first, we'll collect them and we'll use them for this process. Huh. Is there any like chemical or anything you use to preserve any of them or are they just all natural um so if you want a butterfly to last for like a really long time you can do a formal in treatment so this just in completely kills all of the cells and essentially turns them into a wonderful like perfect little display um or you can use uh chemicals inside the boxes uh to eliminate the things like mold or uh decay um these chemicals tend to smell bad, so we don't 
really use them very frequently. Uh, they're more important for cases that will be, all the insects will be put in them, and then it'll be closed, and it will never be opened again. So, so like, you know, sci like scientific collections. Yeah, so like, goals yeah, if you had, whatever. yeah, if you had like a, an animal collection in a museum, perhaps, they sure. would use some, they would use more complicated chemicals than I will. Interesting, interesting. Okay, I do have one more question. So, you know, all those specimens we can see here in our, in the box, in the relaxation box, and even in the butterflies to be pinned box, um, look really nice. They look, you know, intact. In general, mm -hmm. mostly all their wings are there. Um, do we do anything with the not as nice specimens? So the not as nice specimens, this would mean things like that, uh, have lost their bodies or their heads or a wing is mostly destroyed. Um, we will actually use those mostly for our product called ear wings. We make our own in-house like little ear rings uh, that are uh, resin-covered butterfly wings. Uh, that's most frequently what we'll do with them. If they, if the wings aren't intact and not useful for that, um, or and it can't be pinned, we will just discard it. It's, it doesn't have any like scientific value for us. It doesn't have any material value for a guest. So that's not and really yeah, nutritional value. Uh, for nutritional value no, so most of the butterflies that are in that state have already had things like ants eat the majority of the nutritional value, and things like the wings of a butterfly are have no nutritional value. Yeah. It's just a exoskeleton keratin. It's yeah. nothing that anything would want to eat. Interesting. Well, is there anything else you want to tell people about you know pinning butterflies, butterfly boxes in general? Or? Um, I think it's a super fun like thing to do in your spare time it's not super complicated and as long as you're getting species um from the wild that have died naturally there's no issue with environmental concerns um it's super fun it's super cheap it's super fun uh interesting uh there's plenty of videos online ours or anything else that we could uh that you could get into it so i think it's a fun hobby that a lot of people could try so you can learn a lot while you do it, right? Yeah, you can learn a lot. Uh, people tell you you can find tons of interesting facts about butterflies. You can find tons of interesting facts about any insect in this way. Uh, and it actually gives you a uh, wonderful insight to how complicated those tiny little bugs' bodies are. Uh, very interesting. Thank you so much, Colton, for sharing yeah. with us and for, for joining us today. I appreciate it, as always. It's always mm -hmm. a treat to have you. And Happy to do it. Interrupted. <laughs> and thank you dear viewer, for tuning in to see all this wonderful information Colton has decided to tell us. Uh, join us next time for another behind the scenes live stream where we, I don't know, look at something else cool. I don't know what yet, but probably figure it out. See you then. Bye.